Hello, and welcome to this special discussion here on DiEM25. Today is Holocaust Remembrance Day, a date of enormous symbolic importance in Europe, marking one of the darkest chapters in human history. It's a day of particular significance in Germany, of course. The so-called remembrance culture, Germany's reckoning with the legacy of the Nazi periods and the industrial scale genocide perpetrated by the Nazi regime, have been much lauded internationally. But today, parts of this culture are increasingly coming into question by many, with charges of anti-Semitism being used by German institutions to silence voices speaking up for the rights of Palestinians in particular. The targets of these charges are disproportionately Palestinian themselves, Arabs more broadly, and Jews. On the international stage, meanwhile, Germany's long steadfast support for the state of Israel, which remains unshaken even as the civilian toll in Gaza continues to climb to ever more obscene numbers, has raised the ire of many. The support, of course, is again justified by the legacy of the Holocaust and the German state's resulting sense of responsibility towards the security of the Jewish state. And what about Israel itself? How has the memory of the Holocaust helped shape Israeli society? And how does it influence the Israeli government's words and actions? To discuss all this, it's my pleasure to welcome Udi Raz. Udi is a doctoral fellow at the Berlin Graduate School for Muslim Cultures and Societies and a board member of Jewish Voice for Just Peace in the Middle East in Germany. Udi, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I kept my uh, intro for you deliberately uh, short. Uh, I know it doesn't do justice to everything that you do into your life history. So if you could just fill in the blanks that I uh, that I left out for us. My name is Udi. I was born and raised in a beautiful port city named Haifa, a city which is located right between Tel Aviv and Beirut. I live in Berlin since 2010. Before that, I lived in Mecklenburg-Vorpommern in north of Germany. Berlin is my home in the last 10 years or even more. We're going to get into your activities in Germany uh, more in depth, especially, you know, since since October, because you've been involved in a lot of in a lot of different things. And a lot of things have happened since then. But before that, something that you did here in Germany for a little while was you worked at the Jewish Museum, right? And we're going to get into the specifics of how you ended up leaving your position there in a minute, because it actually made headlines uh, here in Germany, even outside of Germany. But before doing that, I just wanted to ask you, how did that experience help shape your perception of Jewish life in uh, in Germany and of the, the Holocaust in particular and this remembrance uh, culture that exists here? Yeah, I mean, the, the case of the Jewish Museum is very interesting when we talk about how knowledge about Jews and Judaism nowadays in Germany is being institutionalized. It's important to keep in mind that when we institutionalize knowledge, we actually exercise mechanism of power. We say what is belong within this institution and what, and what doesn't belong there. So the case of the Jewish Museum is a particular case that shows us how in Germany knowledge about Jews and Judaism is being produced, institutionalized, designed, and made maintain in order to create an idea that Judaism can be even be explained through a specific singular institution. My first visit in the Jewish Museum was around the time when I first moved to Berlin more than a decade ago. And all, already back then as a visitor in the Jewish Museum, I felt this sense of awkwardness because I am myself Jewish, I self-identify as a Jewish person. My entire life is very much shaped by this particular identity. My grandparents survived the Holocaust here in Europe and made it to escape uh, to, and to find rescue in a place called Palestine. Uh, later on, we, we'll talk about it later, it led to a very tragic course of events but before I come back to that, I just want to, make, to underline that the Holocaust, Judaism, and Jews in general is very much what defines uh, this, the sense of home, what shaped my understanding of who I am 
in this world. Visiting the Jewish Museum for the first time was awkward because all of a sudden I saw that my life story or the life stories that I'm familiar with are put into exhibitions. You know, like it's my life becomes an exhibit stories of my grandparents, of my communities become stories that are not only mine, but all of a sudden are shared with other individuals and groups uh, that I'm not even familiar with. I felt this sense of ex exposure, but I was also very much uh, uh, intrigued by the fact that many people find so much interest in trying to understand what Judaism mean or what Judaism could mean and how the Jewish Muslim delivers this knowledge. You asked me specifically about um, the topic of Holocaust and I want to share with you my experience within a specific uh, installation at the Jewish Museum. This installation is called Shalechet. Shalechet can be translated into uh, fallen leaves, something like that. And this is an installation that uh, is a cooperation between the architect who designed the structure of the Jewish Museum, his name is Daniel Liebeskind, and together with an artist, his name is Menashe Kadishman, they created this installation. Menashe Kadishman designed and created 10,000 metal pieces, face-shaped, and he places them on the ground of this hall, of this room within the Jewish Museum. And visitors are invited to walk into the room and by doing so, they also walk on the faces that in turn create sound, as if this, those faces actually scream as you walk on them. And this room, this installation is very sensual. There are no words involved, right? You enter a room and it's up to you to perceive what you perceive through your senses. And I think that this is a very powerful statement by the uh, architect and by um, the artist, who in this case really give up on the attempts to conceptualize the Holocaust through words and insist that it's up to you to try to come to terms with what this attempt to define the Holocaust, this experience, does to you. And I think this also is a powerful statement because the artist who, dis who created this installation, Menashe Kadishman, dedicates it to all victims of violence and wars. Right? Kadishman insists that the experience of the Holocaust is something that every human being can identify with. And this is a very powerful statement because war and violence define lives of many, many individuals, communities, and nations, not only in historical context, but right now around us. So in a way, the screaming faces that we hear as we enter the room do not scream only from the past, but it, it kind of asks us to be more attentive to screamings that we should have heard happening now around us. And what is our relationship with this human suffering? Do we have a responsibility toward it? I mean, let's leave this question open, even though I see, I believe that many people who listen to the interview, for them, the answer is clear. And for me too, I also understand my own responsibility, especially when it comes to atrocities being committed in the name of, so to say, protecting me as a Jewish person, not only as a Jewish person, but as a Jewish person who, whose family were affected directly by the atrocities of the Second World War, conceptualized through the term Holocaust. One last thing that I want to say about it is precisely because human suffering is a human being experienced is something every human being can identify with. It also challenges the narrative that we hear around us that one should not and cannot even compare the Holocaust with other manifestations of human suffering. Because I think precisely because everyone who enters this hall can identify with the attempt of conceptualizing the human suffering 
that Kaddishman and Libeskind try to conceptualize there opens up the possibility to understand that empathy is what unites us. And if we can understand what the Holocaust meant for Kaddishman and for Libeskind in their attempts to define what it means, it means that the Holocaust is not a singular case per se. There are some singularities for sure, like any historical event, but the claim that one cannot and should not compare the Holocaust to other manifestations of human suffering should raise the question of why? Who are those who claim, who make this claim, and for what end? It's extremely interesting that you mentioned that because this uh, exhibit that you're talking about might be the most famous one that is part of this remembrance culture here in, in, in Germany. And to learn that the people who, who planned it, the artists who designed it, the message that they intended to send was a message that is taboo in this very remembrance culture in Germany. So this comparison, you know, comparing the Holocaust to, to, other, to, to other genocides, it's a good moment to sort of transition to what many people, including uh, yourself, see as a perversion of this remembrance culture and a failure to learn the lessons that should have been learned uh, from this experience in Germany. And I think a great entry into that is to talk about how you came to not work anymore at the, at the Jewish Museum. So if you could tell us how that happened, um, what uh, you know, your, your actions there ended up resulting in, and more broadly, what does that say about this failure in German society to really reckon with the legacy of the Holocaust? And you know, it's interesting that in this exhibit, like you said, the visitor is supposed to experience it and draw their own conclusions as they are stepping on those uh, faces, which is a very powerful experience. What are the conclusions that German society uh, more broadly have, uh, have drawn? Lucas, those are very interesting questions. Let me start by ex explaining just the course of events that led to uh, the fact that I'm not allowed to walk anymore at the Jewish Museum. I, initially, I worked at the Jewish Museum as a guide. Uh, I, I would walk through the exhibitions, through the building, together with, uh, with groups, mostly with uh, high school students who, as part of, of their uh, school trip, they also come to Berlin and visit the Jewish Museum. The Jewish Museum is quite a big project, and indeed, one can spend there more than one day for sure, because the museum is divided into different sections, into different topics. I was specialized in the topic of Jews in Germany after 1945, after the Second World War. There are many different topics we are dealing with, talking about uh, commemoration, about demography, demography of Jews in Germany, about how Germany understands who Jews are, and so on and so on. But there is a specific room towards the end of this section that is framed as the Israel Room. In this room, the Jewish museums uh, or the curators try to link the dots or narratives that link the categories Jews, Israel, and Germany. Jews, Israel, Germany. In this room, you find different uh, video installations that actually show uh, are documentaries in, in their essence that uh, show try to thematize those, uh, these topics. So in this room, I talk uh, with uh, the people who visit uh, my tours, we talk about the shifts from the, the end of the Second World War until nowadays, the shifts that characterize the re relationship between the state of Israel and the uh, Federal Republic of Germany. Back then, West Germany, nowadays we, we refer to it as, as their Germany, right? The one uh, united Germany. So we see in the beginning, in the 50s, it's written in, in um, Israeli passports that those passports were applicable to all states, but to the state of Germany. So we see that in the beginning, there are no any relationship between Israel and the state of Germany. Something changes then in the 60s for different reasons. I will not go into uh, depth in it 
at the moment, but for different reasons. Something changes in the 60s where the first German diplomat visits Israel for the first time and Israel and West Germany establish a diplomatic relationship for the first time. And then in, throughout the next few decades, the relationship remains relatively cold between the two states. There is this sense of ambivalence. And then something remarkable happens in 2008 as Angela Merkel, back then the Chancellor of the state of Germany, visits Israel for the, fir for the first time and holds a very famous speech in front of the Israeli parliament of the Knesset, where she announces that Israel is Germany raison d'etat, is Germany's Staatsraison, as they say in German. From this moment on, we see another shift in the relationship between Israel and Germany. Israel stands on the side of Israel without regard to what Israel is actually doing. And we all know that with the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948, this year also marks the beginning of the Nakba. The Nakba is the catastrophe in Arabic that narrates, in, uh, uh, from a Palestinian perspective, narrates the living realities, ongoing living realities that characterizes Palestinian uh, lives uh, since then in our world around us. Palestinians, the indigenous people of the land, were forced, most of them, to uh, go into exile. They're, and until nowadays, they are not allowed to go back into their homes that they left back then. Many of them live also here in Germany. We'll come back to this later because it's an important fact to keep in mind. But what I want to uh, continue with is the fact that the ongoing Nakba means also Jewish supremacy in the land of Palestine or Israel, dep depends on how you define this geographical area between the river to the sea. Because in order to maintain Jewish state, by definition, you have to create a sense that one population, namely Jews, have the power to decide how the living realities should be look like. When we talk about Israel, we talk about a Jewish state. By implication, we talk about a democracy designed by Jews for Jews. The fact that also other Jews participate in decision making is not central to the goal of the, cent of the state of Israel as a Jewish state. It's rather a byproduct to the fact that not only Jews live in the state of Israel or in Palestine. What we witness nowadays in Gaza is an extreme manifestation of Jewish supremacy. And the fact that the state of Germany stands on the side of Israel, even when more than 11,000 children in Gaza have been killed so far by the Israeli military, even that the numbers of dead people exceeded 30,000 people. We're talking about mass murder in, in dimensions that we haven't seen before happening in the land of Palestine uh, committed by the state of Israel. And the fact that Israel stands on, on the side of Israel also against this reality is quite telling. It's quite telling that for Germany, Palestinians are not matter. To stand on the side of Israel against these atrocities this is quite telling. What I want to go with this, with this uh, story that I'm telling you is that what characterizes living realities of individual living between the river to the sea, according to human rights organizations, among them also Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, but also Israeli human rights organization, they all come to the conclusion that this living reality is better described as an apartheid state. In my tours, I don't talk in general about the fact that the entire area is ruled by Jewish supremacy, but I use very carefully the term apartheid only when referring to the living realities of Jews and Palestinians who live in the West Bank. This is where we see the so-called 
settlements, for example. So Jews who live in settlements have Israeli citizenship. Accordingly, they are allowed to vote in the Israeli par parliament, right? This is one example. But Palestinians who live in the exact same areas do not have the Israeli citizenship. They are not allowed to vote for the Israeli parliament. So this is only one example of why it's so important to point out to the injustice realities that characterizes the lives of Palestinians and Jews who live in this given area. It's important for me to note, to underline, that whenever I speak, it's not my uh, arguments, right? I, I base this knowledge on uh, scientific knowledge productions produced by human rights organizations. Really, every human rights organization that researches about the living realities in this area comes to the same conclusion, better described as apartheid system. For the Jewish Museum, it was too much. What does the Jewish Museum do in order to address such kind of injustice? They fire the only person who does speak about it. It's clear to me that not everyone is interested or affected by those living realities, but I am. And when the Jewish Museum hired me to work for them, they insisted that I should bring in my own experience, my own voice as a Jewish person coming from Palestine, Israel to Germany and share it with the people who come with me to the tours. This was part of the deal. The fact that this was too much for the Jewish Museum is quite telling. It's telling that the Jewish Museum does not care about Jewish living realities or Jewish living experiences, but it cares about creating a sense of Jewishness that fits into a certain legacy that the Jewish Museum wishes to promote. My case there, the fact that they fired me, helped us to understand better what is this legacy, what is the agenda of the Jewish Museum. Namely, this is an agenda better described as Zionist ideology. We can come back to this topic later, but this is my experience within the Jewish Museum, how the Jewish Museum involves in not only shaping what Judaism means and who Jews are, but also actively excluding Jewish voices who do not fit into their own understanding of how they wish Jews would be, think, and act. With that, I wanted to, to follow up and ask you a very simple question, really. Do you, as a Jewish person, feel respected living in Germany? I wish I could say yes. The answer is more complicated. On the one hand, I understand and I acknowledge that many Germans, especially those who are in power positions, wish to come to terms with the atrocities of the Second World War, and specifically with the Holocaust, with the mass extermination of the Jewish population of Europe. Right? How do you do this? To be honest, I don't know, but there are many different attempts. We can see, it, for example, in restitutions, in compensations, right? Like financial attempts, we can say. There is also attempts in the forms of migration law. In the 90s, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, Jews were allowed to migrate to Germany. Also nowadays, Israeli, they have it much easier than other nations to simply migrate to Germany, to get visa and all of that. But there is one specifically attempt that I find really painful and harmful and really tragic. And this attempt that says that Germany stands on the side of Israel doesn't matter what Israel is doing. For me, this signals that German policymakers do not care about Jews as such, but they care about Israel, the interest of a nation state, singling that Jewish, Jewishness is not a category of a pluralistic society, but rather a singular voice, a voice that can be represented through a singular institution. And the fact that this institution, the state of Israel, committing atrocities in the name of Jews, in the name of Judaism, 
And the Germany not only remains silent against it, but actually supports the ongoing atrocities with weapon, with money, with diplomacy. This is really shocking for me, especially as a Jew living in Germany. I moved to Germany back then. I migrated here with the promise that I can live my life in a progressive, democratic, liberal state. Since the 7th of October, latest then, we, all the masks have fallen. It is clear that when we talk about Germany, we cannot anymore talk about democracy. Because let me come back for a moment to what I told you before about Palestinians being forced to leave their homes in 1948. Many Palestinians also come to Germany. In fact, Berlin has the biggest Palestinian community in Europe nowadays. The fact that since 2001, Palestinians are not allowed to commemorate in public their own catastrophe, the Nakba, is a signal that Germany is a democracy that does not consider Palestinians and Palestinian voices or even Jews like me who orient themselves in relation to also to their living realities and historical narrative, it's quite telling that Germany is not a democratic designed for everyone. So the question that we need to ask ourselves is who does have access to the democratic decision-making here in Germany and who does not? And why is it this way? I also learned since the 7th of October that Jews like me, Jewish people like me, who wish to show solidarity, not only with our victims who are Israeli, but also with non-Jews who suffer under the living realities, especially those who live nowadays in Gaza, but also in the West Bank, we are not allowed to do so. So this democracy that some people refer to as Germany, is not even designed for Jews as Jews. We had the pleasure of uh, speaking with a colleague of yours uh, here in our in our channel before. It is a vet, also from Jewish Voice for Just Peace in the Middle East here in Germany, and she she put it very bluntly, as she usually does. Uh, she said, "To be an uh, an Arab or Palestinian or Muslim in Germany right now is horrible." They are the new Jews. Do you agree with, with that statement? And if yes or no, why? I agree with this statement because now there's Arabs, especially Arabs, but I, I'm talking about Muslims in general. They are standing in the focus of political attempts to define the selfhood of Germany as a nation state. We, still, we saw it very clearly, for example, uh, with uh, Thomas de Maizière, who in 2017 published uh, 10 uh, key points to, for, who, ah, by the way, Thomas de Maizière was back then in 2017, he was the uh, minister, uh, minister of uh, Inner Affairs here in Germany in uh, a Merkel government. And he published 2017 a list of seven uh, key characteristics of what, what Germany or what Germanness should mean or could mean, it refers to it as light culture, leading culture. What is the leading culture of Germany? And when you look at it, you see that more often than not, this attempt to define what is the leading culture of Germany is done by defining what Germany is not. And the headline of uh, the article that uh, Thomas de Maizière, uh, published is called Wir sind nicht Burka we are not the Burka, which means Islam really stands in the center of German attempts to define what Germany is by saying what Germany is not. Interestingly enough, this term leading culture, light culture, according to de Maizière, but not only according to de Maizière, many other individuals use the same term. They refer to it as a Judeo-Christian leading culture that characterizes this the essence of German being. So accordingly, to focus or to put the focus on Muslims as those who do not and even cannot be part of this Germanness signals 
that Muslims as such and Arab people specifically are excluded from this idea of being part of a leading society. This is very similar to what we see when we look historically on mechanism of political discourses that characterized Germany and Central Europe or, and Western Europe even before the 30s when anti-Semitism emerges as a political ideology. Right? All of a sudden politicians try to make the claim we understand ourselves, ourselves by saying what we are not, namely we are not Jews. Jews become the problem or the question that characterizes the political discourse around European selfhood back then. And this is really similar to what we are witnessing nowadays in Germany. Later on, we witnessed how Jews are being excluded from political decision-making, from the political realm. This is very similar to what we are witnessing nowadays in the case of Palestinians and Arabs. And I hope that from now on, things will get better. It's really a call for German policy makers to wake up because we also see how the AfD, the party alternative for Germany, is on the rise at the moment. And this party is an ext right extremist party in Israeli context. It's uh, the party that governs nowadays the state of Israel. And we see uh, to what extreme and how dangerous such a government can be specifically for Palestinians and Arabs. And with that, I wanted to focus, uh, to, to uh, shift the focus back to, to Palestine and to, and to Israel. Our discussion here is, is centered around the, the Holocaust. And a question that comes to mind to me, uh, especially opposed to you as someone who grew up in Israel, is how did the Holocaust and the legacy and the memory of the Holocaust how did it affect and continues to affect the consciousness of Israeli society and also the, 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 the words and actions of the Israeli government? Because, and, and I ask this question not just because, you know, on the, on the surface level, it, it's obviously a pertinent question, but also because Zionism, of course, precedes the Holocaust by a pretty long time, which is something that I think people are not entirely aware of. I know that I wasn't when I was, you know, when I was in school, I basically learned that the Holocaust happened. And then as a result of the Holocaust happening, the state of Israel was established. So you don't really learn about anything that happened before that. You just sort of assume that this horrible thing happened. And then everyone all of a sudden sat together and decided that it would, it would probably be best if the Jewish people had their own state. That is obviously not true uh, at all. That's not, that's not what happened. Of course, the Holocaust was a factor, but Zionism was, again, a project that, uh, that predates it by, by, by quite some time. So what is the relationship between Zionism, between um, Israel and, and in general and Israeli society and the, the Holocaust? Lucas, thank you for the question. That's a very important one. And let me start answering it by reminding us that what we commemorate today is the International Holocaust Remembrance Day. In an Israeli Zionist context, the, what we refer to as the Holocaust Remembrance Day takes place in another date, namely exactly one week before the Independence Day of the State of Israel. And this is a symbolic uh, a narration of how you commemorate the Holocaust because it really links the emergence of the State of Israel with the Holocaust. Without the Holocaust, probably there would never be um, an Israeli Jewish state. And the Holocaust, so to say, signals us why such a state is a necessity. Growing up in Israel since kindergarten, I was exposed to terrible stories of when I was a kid, also many Holocaust survivors were alive, also my grandparents were alive, and they would talk to us very directly with as much empathy as they could. They taught us why it's so important that Jews have are not only in safe, in a safe place, 
but should also be in charge on designing the living realities because otherwise the, alter the alternative and the only alternative possible that can, one should recall in mind is the Holocaust. Commemorating the Holocaust one week before the, the uh, Independence Day of the Israel is, uh, is a signal to the national, even nationalist um, usage of the Holocaust as his, a historical event, putting it into a, not only a historical context, but historical and nationalist context. We can talk about nationalist narrative. And this is really essential to how people in Israel, I'm talking specifically about Zionists, understand the relationship between the Holocaust and the existence of the state of Israel. That kind of answers the question on on a, on the institutional level, um, as far as the state of Israel is concerned, how that affects and, and sort of how, how they also uh, weaponize it, so to speak, as well to to justify all sorts of things. But in Israeli society in general, when we're talking, you know, just in terms of Israeli culture, uh, etc., is it more or less the same thing that's playing out, or is it a bit different? Because, for instance. Something that you read every once in a while is that, and I don't, don't know if I've necessarily ever seen this from a someone you know who who grew up in Israel and Israeli saying this, but there is this argument that at least early on, Israeli society and you know Zionism in general actually frowned upon uh, Holocaust survivors because there was this idea that they represented a, a certain type of weakness. It wasn't this heroic, self-assured new Jew, basically, that uh, Zionism was trying to create. That's the argument that's made. Do you agree with that? Do you perceive that as, again, someone who grew up in, in Israel, that, that if, if, it, if it still is the reality, um, or if it isn't, if it at least used to be? So nowadays, it's not anymore the case, but it's true that in the early years, uh, Holocaust survivors were looked very badly by those who were socialized and grew up uh, in, in Palestine, in Israel. Because really, we need to keep in mind that Zionism, this is their leading ideology, the light culture, leading culture, if we, if we will, that characterizes uh, the hegemonic society uh, that rules the area between the river to the sea in Israel, Palestine. It's important to mention that Zionism emerged in Europe around the time when Europe colonialism was in its peak. One decade before the first uh, Zionist Congress, th there was another Congress took place here in Berlin that it's called the Berliner Congress, where the European empires basically met in order to divide Africa into sections to decide which empire, empire takes what area, so to say, in Africa. And one year before the uh, first Zionist Congress took place in 1897, so one year before, 1896. I, another interesting thing uh, took place here in Berlin. It was the Colonial Ausstellung, the Colonial Exhibition, which was a huge uh, propaganda campaign or advertisement, we can say, of the German Reich to advertise why colonialism is so important how we all, uh, we in sense of everybody who lives in Germany, benefits from colonialism. So around this time, if you understood yourself as a nation, as a modern nation, as an advanced nation, you also understood that you should have a colony. And in fact, in the early years, we see that within the Zionist Congress, the question was not whether Jews as a nation should colonize, but the question was rather where and what Jews as a nation should colonize, right? So Palestine was one option. Other options were Argentina, Uganda, and other areas in the world. Keeping this in mind, the Holocaust, or what happened after the Holocaust, was a tragic reminder to colonialist Jews, to Zionists, that Jews are not as strong as they wish to imagine themselves. All of a sudden, Jews were subjected 
to atrocities that humanity have never seen in such scales before. Right? All of a sudden, Jews were excluded as European Jews from the idea of Europe and were murdered for that. So this put Zionism and Holocaust survivors in, in, in a clash, so to say. How you include the Holocaust within the narrative of a Zionist colonialist modern nation. The thing is that throughout the years, now oh, I can tell you nowadays when, when I was a child even, we would look at Holocaust survivors as heroes. They were my heroes. I would look at my, te as a, my teachers, uh, my grandparents and other people around me, and I thought of them as people who, are, who have superpower. How do you even survive what you also learn in history books and you see in TV and in films like uh, Schindler's List and, you know, and so on and so on. So for me as a child growing up in, in the context, in the Zionist context of Israel, I understood Holocaust survivors as heroes. And I think it, it, it kind of signals to a shift that occurred throughout the years of how Holocaust survivors were indeed included within the historical narrative of Israel, of Zionism. And I think, interestingly, it's also important to keep in mind that the full name of the Holocaust Remembrance Day in Israel is Remembrance Day for the Holocaust and for heroism. Because what Zionists like to commemorate very much is the fact that Jews also being subjected to extreme repression could resist. And calling it to mind, Mordechai and Levitch, for example, who fought in Ghetto Varsha against all odds, and indeed with very limited success, success. But they fought against the rule of the white supremacist power of the Nazis. Uri, one, one final question that I wanted to ask you. Uh, you know, we've talked a lot about German remembrance culture and um, how, you know, the perhaps not really the right uh, lessons were uh, learned as a result of the experience with the uh, Holocaust. But obviously all of this, at least superficially, comes from this necessity in, uh, in, in German society of combating anti-Semitism, this sort of um, uh, preoccupation that, uh, it, it, again, is very distorted and sometimes leads to very bizarre sort of expressions of, uh, of that sort of uh, mission that, that Germany has set for itself. There's also a lot of cynicism in it, a lot of, you know, very hypocritical things. But my question that I wanted to close with, since, again, this is a Holocaust Remembrance Day and, and anti-Semitism is obviously a scourge that uh, we must fight. The, I guess the question is, what is it that we should call it really anti-Semitism? And the, the, the fact that the Israeli state will claim that any sort of criticism to itself is constitutes anti-Semitism complicates matters hugely, right? Uh, so, and, and it's something that a narrative that has been bought by uh, the West in general. Uh, and so it's weaponized to, uh, to silence voices, like we, like we said earlier. But my question now is, in terms of real anti-Semitism, because no one in the right mind will deny that anti-Semitism doesn't exist. The question that I'm left with is, how do you combat anti-Semitism? Really, like, you know, real existing anti-Semitism, how do you combat it effectively? Lucas, this is such an important question. I'm happy that you asked me this. I think it we have to come back to the question of how we define anti-Semitism because I think that in the general discourse nowadays we are kind of lost. There are so many attempts to define anti-Semitism. We hear so many accusations of pe people being accused as anti-Semitic, being subjected to boycott, divestment, and other sanctions that this discourse around anti-Semitism is very much emotional. There is so much power flowing through such attempts to define what is anti-Semitism. One attempt is the so-called IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. This is also the definition that nowadays characterizes the way that Germany and really other, every Western 
nation claims to combat anti-Semitism. When we look at the genealogy of the history of where this definition comes from, we go back to a meeting that took place in 2016 within the body of the IHRA. The IHRA is an acronym of International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. This is an intergovernmental alliance uh, of mostly Western countries that came together in order to define what is anti-Semitism following the wish to effectively combating anti-Semitism. When you look at the definition uh, from, uh, offered by the IHRA uh, of anti-Semitism, you find a definition that is very unclear. And indeed, I think it was also unclear for the framers of the definition. And this is why they found it necessary to attach examples for this definition in order to highlight what anti-Semitism means or what it could mean, perhaps even what it should mean. The thing is that though we are talking about 11 examples, right? seven examples out of, the, of this list address directly the state of Israel. So this definition, or the examples at least, they are focusing our understanding of anti-Semitism always in relation, or mostly in relation to the state of Israel. So we say that, we can say that the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism does not concern Jews as such, but concerns first and foremost, the interests, the national interests of the state of Israel. I think it's quite telling and it's also not surprising because those examples and the definition itself are outcome of a proposal by a US-based Jewish lobby organization for the state of Israel. So we can say that this definition and the examples uh, reflect rather not only the national interest of the state of Israel, but also the US understanding of what are the national interests of the state of Israel are or should be. We are not talking about a scientific definition of anti-Semitism, and yet this definition has been adopted by all members of the IHRA, among them also Germany. So when we nowadays in Germany, we look how anti-Semitism is being discussed, we see more often than not or the, the ruling definition is the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. You can say that the ruling definition of, of anti-Semitism in Germany is anti-scientific. It is indeed pro-Israeli or we can say it is not concerning Jews as such. To my understanding, this is anti-Semitic and perhaps even important to note that the examples that are attached to the IHRA definition were not adopted by the plenary of the IHRA. They were just added there to the definition by the state of Israel. So we can say that this definition is even anti-democratic, anti-scientific, anti-Semitic, and anti-democratic. This is the definition that Germany privileges as the walking definition of anti-Semitism. To my understanding, and from what I learned from my grandparents, anti-Semitism is simply racism towards Jews. And historically, we see that the arguments that anti-Semites used were very similar to the arguments that anti-Semites, that were also colonialists, used in order to justify colonialism. That is to say, they used similar logic, racist logic, to colonize not only population living outside of Europe, but also the population living inside of Europe, those who were marked as not European enough, namely Jews, Sinti, Romans, but also later on sexualized minorities, homosexuals, queer, and later on also disabled bodies, and the list goes on and on. It's quite remarkable that nowadays 
By the virtue of the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, Germany becomes once again a dangerous place for anyone who is not Aryan. Thank you, Udi. And I think these are some uh, some very very some very pertinent food for thoughts that we we finish on uh, with those words. I want to thank you again for joining us. Uh, I want to thank uh, to all. Thank all of you for, for watching this, uh, this discussion with Udi Ras. We'll see you next time and take care, stay safe. Thank you, Udi. Thank you, Lucas.